Laboratory. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with USAID and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Today's webinar will be focused on integrating variable renewable energy into the grid with a focus on key issues and emerging solutions. One important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane on the right side of your screen. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. If you would like to ask a question, and we ask that you please do, you can use the questions pane on the right side of your screen, where you may type it in directly. If you are having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, an audio recording and the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few weeks and will be added to the Solution Center YouTube channel as well. You'll also find other informative webinars, video interviews with thought leaders, and other clean energy policy topics. Today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Dr. Michael Milligan and Jessica Katz. Jennifer Leish has also joined us today to help moderate the question and answer portion of the webinar. Our panelists will be reviewing challenges to integrating significant quantities of variable renewable energy into the grid and discussing emerging solutions that policymakers, regulators, and grid operators have taken to integrate wind and solar to meet renewable energy targets. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I will provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. Then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session, closing remarks, and a brief survey. This slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solutions Center came to be. The Solutions Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other Clean Energy Ministerial partners. Outcomes of this unique initiative include support for developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert fee assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you are attending today. The Solutions Center has four primary goals. It serves as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. It serves to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. It delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of its experiences. And finally, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Our primary audience is energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, though we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. One of the marquee features of the Solutions Center is the no-cost expert policy assistance known as Ask an Expert. The Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. For example, in the area of renewable electricity policy, we are very pleased to have Paul Comer, Energy Education Director at the Renewable and Sustainable Energy Institute, serving as one of our experts. If you have a need for policy assistance in renewable electricity policy or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. Again, the assistance is provided free of charge. If you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. Or to find out how the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, please contact Sean Esterly directly at sean.esterly at nrel.gov or call him at 303-384-7436. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. Now I'd like to go ahead and provide brief introductions for today's panelists. First up today is Dr. Michael Milligan, a Principal Analyst with the Transmission and Grid Integration Group at NREL. His research focuses on large-scale integration of wind and solar energy on the bulk power system, on which he has authored or co-authored more than 200 journal articles, 
conference papers, technical reports, and book chapters. Michael has provided expert testimony in numerous public utility commission proceedings and workshops, and he advises power system planners and operators on wind and solar integration issues. Our second speaker today will be Jessica Katz. Jessica is an analyst at NREL and focuses on coordinating and implementing technical assistance in support of the U.S. government's Enhancing Capacity for Low Emission Development Strategies, or EC-LEDS program. She has developed tools and trainings related to clean energy development topics such as renewable energy resource assessment and integration of large-scale renewable energy systems to the grid to accelerate sustainable economic growth and minimize greenhouse gas emissions. And finally, moderating our question and answer session today, we will have Jennifer Leash. Jennifer is a climate change mitigation specialist in the USAID Office of Global Climate Change. She supports the U.S. Enhancing Capacity for Low Emission Development Strategies Program and manages the USAID Greening the Grid Partnership. She also directs agency work to account for greenhouse gas emissions reductions as a result of USAID clean energy programs. And with those introductions, I'd like to go ahead and welcome uh, Dr. Milligan to the webinar and hand it over to him to get us rolling. Great. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you all for uh, joining us on this webinar. Um, what, what we'd like to do is, is to uh, talk about some of the key issues uh, surrounding how to integrate large amounts of renewable energy, uh, primarily wind and solar, on, onto the power system. And so in, in our agenda here, we will start with those key issues, uh, taking a look at some of the key challenges. Uh, we'll then move on and, and talk about flexible power systems. Uh, it turns out that uh, the more flexibility that we have in the power system, the easier it is to manage the increase in variability and uncertainty from wind and, and solar resources. Uh, part three, we'll take a look at some uh, a few common myths and, and some uh, frequently asked questions. Um, and actually, there are many, many of those questions. We'll just touch on, on some of the key ones. Um, and then uh, we'll discuss the, uh, the toolkit that we have for greening the grid. And then we'll wrap up with uh, a bit of uh, Q&A. So uh, as, as we move through the material, if you do have a question, please uh, uh, use the webinar facility to ask it, and we will uh, try to get to all the questions uh, at the end, as many as we can. So uh, moving on, um, the, the key grid integration issues uh, section of this, we, the, the reason that uh, grid integration is important is that we, we see trends in, in many countries where we've got a, a combination of an increase in demand, uh, in many cases, we have an increase in urbanization, which, which is obviously connected uh, to uh, increasing demand for energy. Uh, and of course, we're focusing on electricity here, but um, one, one of the key concerns that, that many countries have is, is how to help mitigate climate change. And so one of the motivating factors in, in moving towards more wind and solar, uh, perhaps the key motivating factor, is to try to reduce emissions and, uh, and mitigate climate change issues. Uh, at the same time, in many areas, there's a need for grid modernization. And, and it turns out that some of the things that we would need to do to the grid to modernize it, to increase its efficiency, are also things that we can do to help integrate more wind and solar. So that, that's kind of a nice uh, a synergy between these two things. So. Uh, what, what we focus on a lot here at NREL and, and others around the world also take, take a look at these issues, how can we design and how can we operate the power system in such a way that we can more efficiently integrate renewable energy? And when I say efficiently, uh, we want to do it at, at least cost and we want to do it uh, according to some reliability target which can be set by different uh, countries uh, based on, on policy decisions. Uh, so as, as we move on, um, what is it that's unique about renewable energy? It's, it's variable and, and it's uncertain, and it's geographically diverse. And, and that, that dispersion that we get of wind and solar actually help when we take a look at the variability. And we'll take a look at that in, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, what this does is that it, it suggests that the, the increase in variability and uncertainty means that we need more flexibility on the power system. And I, and I do want to note that even in power systems with no wind and no solar, uh, there's still a significant amount of variability and uncertainty. You don't, you don't know when a transmission line is going to trip off, when a, a generating unit is going to fail. 
Uh, demand varies throughout the day as a function of weather and, and a host of other variables. Uh, but when we add wind and solar, we, we certainly do increase the level of variability and, and the level of uncertainty that has to be managed by the power system operator. When we add a lot of wind and solar to the system, it, it also means that existing thermal assets are used less, frequency, uh, less frequently, uh, which if you think about it, is part of the point. Uh, we, we want to reduce the fuel that we're burning so that we can uh, reduce emissions. Uh, but that can present some challenges with respect to uh, some units that still need to be paid for. How are they going to cover their cost? Um, we do need more uh, reserves. Uh, and that does not mean that we need to build more generation when we have uh, variable renewables, but it does mean that we may need to have some additional operating reserves to help us manage times when uh, the, the wind dies down or, or the solar uh, is, is reduced because of a cloud or, or things like that. Uh, we generally will need more transmission um, and, and better planning. That's, that's a tough one, but um, it's, um, you know, the fact of life is that when you're putting in particularly wind turbines, uh, windy regions are, are typically not close to population centers, and so you need to deliver that wind energy via wire to, to the demand center. And, and of course, that, that's where the requirement for transmission comes in. And, and uh, solar inverters and, and wind turbines uh, can now provide a, a large number of what we call ancillary services. Um, services that the grid needs in addition to just supplying energy. And some examples are listed here. Voltage control, it's important to maintain voltage um, within certain limits so that uh, devices work properly, the, the grid continues to operate. Um, and, and there's uh, something called inertial response and frequency response that wind turbines uh, and, and inverter panels can provide. That, that provision typically comes with an increase in cost. But what that actually does is it allows uh, the renewable energy sources to actually provide some of the flexibility that, that is needed to run the power system. So let's, let's talk about flexibility. Uh, this next graph is, is an example. Every system is a little bit different, but, but we think that this graph does a, a, a nice job of showing what it means when we add variable renewable energy into the power system with respect to variability. So what you see in the graph is um, this is actually one week of data. And on the y-axis of the graph, we're measuring megawatts, and so megawatts of demand. And on the x-axis, we're measuring time. And, and I apologize, the axis isn't terribly informative. But, but you do see midnight, and you see 12 noon uh, for one week on this axis. Now, as we, as we start uh, kind of dissecting this graph a little bit, the the yellow curve that you see sort of in the back represents demand. And so in a power system with no wind and with no solar, uh, the, all the generating fleet, coal, gas, whatever you have, hydro, uh, would be dispatched in such a way that uh, that yellow trace of energy would be supplied every hour of, of the day for this, this entire week. Well, in this particular example, we add a lot of wind energy. And you see the wind energy at the bottom of the graph in green. Um, it's measured on the same scale. So if you take a look uh, right before February 20th at zero hours, you'll see the wind peaks at nearly 5,000 megawatts or 5 gigawatts. Um, and you can see that the wind is, is pretty variable in this week. And there, there are times that there, there's a lot of wind energy. And if you take a look along uh, February 23rd on the axis, you'll see that there isn't very much wind. And, and so clearly, there's a lot of variability that's introduced by this wind. But what does that mean for the way that I operate the power system? Well, if, if I am able to make full use of all of that wind energy for this entire week, uh, you can imagine that uh, we could take the demand and subtract out whatever the wind is supplying. And whatever's left is what I need to supply with my existing thermal units, my hydro units, and so forth. And we call that net load, or, or sometimes net demand. And you'll see that depicted in this picture with the orange trace. So essentially, we start with the yellow demand. We subtract off the green wind. And what's left is the net demand, which is the orange curve. And so that, that allows us to now compare 
what is it that my hydrothermal fleet has to be able to do in order to accommodate all of this energy, all of this wind energy? And what it has to be able to do is shown on the orange graph, and we can take a look at, at some of the things going on. So for example, you'll see a, a notation for shorter peaks. Uh, well, on, on uh, February 19th, the, the net peak, right, the demand minus wind, is quite a lot less than the peak demand by itself. The peak demand is somewhere around uh, 12,000 megawatts. Uh, the net peak demand is something uh, around 8,000, a little bit more than 8,000 megawatts. A ramp is, is a change in, in demand, or it can be a change in, in generator output. And you can see the, the next uh, annotation talks about steeper ramp. The ramp is simply the, the steepness and the length of the curve. And so the arrow is pointing to the fact that we have a steeper ramp uh, right around February 20th, starting um, you know, sometime in the middle of the night. Uh, that ramp is, is steeper, and it's deeper than the yellow ramp. And so that, that can be a challenge for system operation. And then the final feature that you can see is that we, we need to be able to turn down our hydrothermal fleet to a lower minimum generation level. So if you can sort of visually look for the minimum of the yellow curve throughout the entire week, it's somewhere around 10, 10 gigawatts. If you look at the minimum of the orange curve, you'll find that it's roughly half of that actually a little bit to the right of where the arrow is, you see where the green and the orange uh, almost intersect. Uh, we have about 5,000 megawatts of net demand. So that means that if I have a lot of coal units or gas units, uh, in order to take advantage of all this wind energy, I need to be able to reduce the generation from my coal and gas to 5,000 megawatts now. Whereas in the past, with no wind, all I had to do is to reduce the uh, generation to about 10,000 megawatts. So these are the, uh, some of the key challenges uh, with respect to the variability that the power system operator is faced with. And of course, the question is, uh, can we manage this increase in flexibility? And the answer is, um, well, yes, there's a lot of tools. Now, um, I'm, I'm not going to attempt to go through this uh, somewhat complicated but, but really thorough uh, graph. What I, what I would like to do is sort of draw your attention along the bottom of the graph where you, you see the, the box labeled system operation, and then market, load, flexible generation, networks, and storage. So these are sort of the categories of, of things that we can look at to help increase the flexibility on the system. Uh, so for example, with markets, uh, there, there are market designs that, that can be uh, put together. We have many of those in the US and some in Europe. That, that can be uh, designed in such a way to elicit as much flexibility from the power system as possible. And there are a number of specific steps involved with that. Um, the, the next sort of category is load or demand. And uh, with demand, uh, there, there's the opportunity to have uh, uh, either residential customers or more often commercial customers uh, actually behave in a sense like a generator where they, they can uh, reduce or curtail their demand. And they, if they're doing that to provide a service to the power system operator, there's typically a payment involved. So if I'm a, a, a company, I can easily um, turn off or turn down my productive process for a while. I get a payment for that in return. That might be uh, nice for everybody. Uh, flexible generation is, is also clearly important. Um, so uh, there's some generation is more flexible than others, uh, other types of generation. So uh, that can be a source of flexibility. And, and then um, obviously transmission networks uh, help deliver the energy to where it needs to go and then storage. And so what you see here in this gray box that just appeared on the screen, this is sort of a summary of, I think, the key points uh, that you can, you can take from this particular slide. There are many options for increasing flexibility. Uh, every power system starts from a, a, a different starting place. So some, some systems may have implemented some of these things already. Uh, others may not have implemented very many of these. Uh, but there are many, many options. Um, and one of the really key points is that even though I may have a lot of flexible generation, I may not have the appropriate institutional framework in place to allow me to access that flexibility. I can give you a quick example. Here in the Western United States, 
uh, we have balancing regions which are, are not part of large organized markets. Within the balancing region, there's generation owned by a third party, and the the uh, dispatch, the, the process of moving the generation to match demand, is done once every hour. And so if I happen to build a flexible generator in a region like that, uh, the power system operator would have no mechanism to ask me to turn the unit up or to turn the unit down unless they waited until the top of the next hour. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then the, the third point here is that uh, the cost of flexibility options will vary. Uh, but we think that institutional changes can be among the most cost effective. Once you make the change, it may involve expensive new uh, communications uh, devices, uh, computer software and hardware. But once those uh, changes have been implemented, they can deliver the benefit for forever, essentially. Uh, so as we move on, I, I said I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of, of um, faster economic dispatch. This particular graph uh, shows two different ways of meeting the demand. And in both cases, demand is shown by the green line. Now, in, in both graphs, the green line is exactly the same. So we're not changing the demand. Uh, what this diagram or these diagrams are doing, are they're showing the change in the way that we could operate the system. So let's start on the left. On the left-hand side, on the y-axis, we have megawatts of, of demand, millions of watts of demand. Uh, we have a sort of a general time scale. It's not clearly labeled here, but uh, this, this is a, a, a couple of hours of, of time. And, and the, time, the amount of time is the same on both, axi on, on both graphs. So if you take a look on the left, you see that uh, on, on the left, uh, just above the red, it says hourly schedule. And then you'll see an up ramp. And so that unit is now being directed to increase its output. And then you see a, a pretty long, flat red line. And so that long, flat red line represents uh, the hour or so where this particular generator is running at a constant output. But then if you take a look and compare that flat red line with the green line, which is moving all over the place, you'll see that there's still a lot of variability. And the economic dispatch is not able to respond within the hour because of the institutional practice of saying, we only dispatch once an hour. So how do you meet that demand? You meet that demand by taking a subset of your generating units, a small group of generators that can that can respond to what we call automatic generation control signals. And that subset of your generation fleet has to respond to all that variability. And we call that regulation. And you can see that there's a lot of regulation. And again, I want to emphasize that that regulation that you see is provided by a small number of generating units because most of the generating units are always run on economic dispatch. So then compare that to what happens on the right-hand side, where we have a sub-hourly dispatch. And in this case, it's, it's a five-minute dispatch. So what that means is that there's a computer software that has all of the information for all the generating units. It's monitoring the demand. It knows exactly what the demand is. It can uh, calculate a, a, a fast demand forecast for the next five or 10 minutes. And, and so what you see now is instead of having uh, a, a flat dispatch, now we see a new line, which is a blue line. And you can see that it, it operates in, in some kind of small stair-step uh, sort of function. And what that means is that the economic dispatch is responding every five minutes and can therefore come pretty close to matching the demand. And the key thing to compare between these two figures is the amount of regulation that's needed. Uh, on the left, we talked about it. There's a lot of regulation that's required. And again, that's required to be provided by a small number of, of generating units on my system. On the right-hand side, um, I still have a small number of units providing the regulation, but there's clearly a lot less regulation that needs to be provided. And, and so in the economic dispatch, I'm, I'm allowing more units to respond. Uh, they're responding more quickly. And so I can, I can incorporate all the response to variability, or most of the response, into a five-minute economic uh, dispatch, which, which really helps. And, and it brings out some flexibility that you have in the power system. The other thing that you can do 
is expand the, the balancing footprint. Uh, larger systems are generally easier to balance, and, and that, that comes about for two reasons. Uh, one reason is that the demand tends to smooth out uh, over longer, uh, over sorry, over wider areas. So one region might be experiencing an increase in demand at the same time a neighboring region is experiencing a decrease in demand. So if they can sort of net out their their demand changes, everybody can dispatch their units less, which results in cost savings. The other thing that happens, which is what this graph shows, is that the, the variability of, of variable renewable energy is reduced over large areas. Uh, the data that you see here comes from a wind plant in Minnesota, here in the United States. Uh, that wind plant has many, many wind turbines, and, and you can see on the graph um, that the, the red line is showing the variability for 15 turbines, and the blue line, I believe it is, is showing the variability from 200 turbines. And, and the thing to note here is the red line from the small number of turbines, 15 turbines, is moving around a lot. It's highly variable. But if you take a look at the 200 turbine output, it does vary also, but it's not varying nearly to the extent that the red line is. And, and this is simply illustrating that when I have 200 wind turbines, uh, they're going to be spread out over a larger geographic area, and the wind doesn't do the same thing at every wind turbine location, and so you tend to get the smoothing. Uh, this example is only for uh, 15 turbines and 200 turbines. It's, it's one second data for 12 hours, uh, but the same principle w would apply if you were looking at many hundreds or even thousands of turbines and especially if those turbines are split among multiple different locations, different wind farms or, or different wind plants. And the same principle applies to solar, where clouds will come by and cover up some of the solar panels in one region, but will not cover the solar panels in another region. So th there are a number of things that we can do to increase uh, coordination between balancing areas. And, and this is a kind of a conceptual diagram that shows several different steps that could be taken. And if we start in the bottom left, um, and, and we say, well, sorry, the y-axis is showing how much this will help with integration of renewables, and the x-axis is, is showing sort of the time scale of coordination. So down at the bottom left, uh, we have a box called contingency reserves. And, and this is essentially the process for determining what level of, of uh, both spinning and non-spinning reserve needs to be online or, or ready to come online to cover a contingency. If a, a generating unit trips offline or a transmission line trips open, uh, we can have two or more areas sharing their contingency reserve obligation. Uh, it's a very common thing. Uh, I know in the United States we've been doing this for decades, and, and it, it does help a little bit with renewable integration, but, but not so much because uh, most wind and solar is, is never going to be large enough, uh, and the output will never change fast enough to constitute what we call a contingency, which is a, a sudden drop in output that happens uh, sub-seconds. Uh, but as you move up the scale and look at the various building blocks here, uh, the, the next uh, category, if you will, is, is regulating reserves. So we, we could have two or more neighboring systems that share regulating reserves. This is something else that, uh, that's been done in parts of the United States, uh, sharing only regulating reserves. And what that does is that it results in everybody needing a little bit less uh, regulation, which is a cost saving. Uh, the next box is flexibility reserve, which is uh, essentially the reserve that you need to cover variability and uncertainty with wind and solar. Um, so you could have two or more regions that share flexibility reserves. But up to this point, the two or more regions have, have not, in my, in my description here, they've not decided to go into some sort of coordinated economic dispatch, and, and that's sort of the next step. Uh, we, could, we could coordinate economic dispatch. A good example of that in the United States uh, right now is the, an energy imbalance market, which is now operating in California and, and part of the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> and in this type of a setup, uh, the, the two regions still separately do their unit commitment, which is starting up their, their units 
uh, usually a day in advance or more. Um, so, so that process is not coordinated yet, but what they do is that they combine the economic dispatch across the two uh, or more footprints, which results in savings because one region might be uh, having an increase in demand at the same time another region is having a decrease. And this economic dispatch coordination allows us to, to net that out so that we're, we're not chasing demand up in one area at the same time we're chasing demand down in the next area. And then the final uh, coordinating step would be unit commitment. And this, this really involves a full operational coordination where two or more regions would get together. Uh, they'd have a process, probably a, a big computer with fast uh, you know, calculation capability, and, and they would commit or start up the generation a day or more in advance by taking a look at the entire merged region, two or more regions together, coordinate unit commitment, which would generally result in the need for less units being online tomorrow or, or the next day. And so uh, this, this whole idea of consolidated operation can happen at a lot of different levels. And again, going back to the, uh, the beginning, we started with contingency and regulating reserve. Uh, there's some benefits to doing that, but as you move up these steps, you find that the benefit goes up, as does the cost, because uh, these are more costly options. But, but again, these can be uh, really good solutions long term, because once they're put in place, uh, they're put in place forever. So, so moving on, uh, the other source of flexibility is, is increasing thermal cycling. Uh, these graphs came from a large study at NREL, and, and I, I don't want to go through all the gory details, because there's a lot here, but I'd like to draw your attention to the black trace in the curve. Each graph is showing a, a week of, of generation. Um, on the y-axis, we show how much uh, generation in gigawatts is, is, uh, is running, and, and we can see time on the x-axis. So I want to draw your attention to the black part, which represents the cold generation. And in the upper panel, we don't have any wind and solar, and the cold generation is running at nearly a constant level of output for the whole week. Uh, in the bottom graph, we have a substantial amount of both wind and solar energy, 33% so annually of all energy is coming from wind and solar. And if I can, again, draw your attention to the black trace, uh, the coal units are now moving around a lot more. You can see at the beginning of the week, they're generating um, you know, somewhere around maybe 30 gigawatts, sorry, minus the nuclear, uh, which is in red. And then you can see around March 29th, March 30th, they're not generating very much at all. Uh, some people thought that coal generators couldn't do this. We, we can't ramp our coal units. We can't adjust them. But it turns out uh, different coal units can be uh, adjusted at, at different rates, and some of them are easier to adjust than others. Um, and, and coal units that have difficulty in moving around like this can be potentially retrofit so that they can move around. So, um, you can extract more flexibility from existing thermal resources, even if those resources are coal. Uh, and one of the most interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years is that we can actually get flexible generation from wind itself and also from solar. But this graph is, is talking primarily about what's talking only about wind. This is an example from uh, near where we are here at NREL, the Public Service Company of Colorado. What the graph shows is a, a period of time starting uh, at about 2 in the morning and ending at about 6 in the morning. And so you'll see that on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have megawatts. And, and the, the graph is showing a couple of different things I'll walk you through. Uh, it shows the uh, potential of this particular wind farm or, or wind park. And this is a particularly windy night. And so uh, with all of the turbines generating, or nearly all of them, uh, you, you could get just over 500 megawatts of generation out of the, the wind turbine. Now what happened is the operator uh, came in on the, the, the night shift and, and took a look at the, the uh, we call the area control error, which is abbreviated ACE, and you can see the yellow trace on the graph. Uh, you want to have low ACE because the, the area control error is measuring the, the imbalance that you have on your system. And for public service of Colorado, uh, an ACE that's within about 50 megawatts plus or minus is, is, is fine. 
But the operator came to work and found that ACE was, uh, was more than 200 megawatts, and the operator said, I've got to do something about that. Uh, there was low demand, there was high wind, so the operator at 245 uh, initiates what we call a block curtailment of wind. Uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm just going to turn all the wind down to 300 megawatts, and, and that'll fix ACE. Well, you can see that uh, on the graph that happened at, at 245, 255, ACE dropped, but, but it turns out that ACE went to negative, you know, negative 100 megawatts, and the operator said, well, you know, I've, I've overcompensated. And so the next step was to put the wind on what we call automatic generation control. This is the same feature that we use to, to regulate the power system with other units. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, at 4 o'clock, the wind is put on AGC. And you can see that after 4 o'clock, the wind moves around a little bit. So uh, some of the wind is, is being curtailed. But if you take a look at ACE, ACE remains within 50, mega, 50 megawatts plus or minus for the rest of the of the time period. Um, so this demonstrates that you can actually get a lot of flexibility out of wind. In this case, the wind generation was turned down a little bit. We were not fully utilizing all the possible wind energy, but at the same time, we were able to use the flexibility in, in the wind turbine controls and the wind plant controls to help manage uh, balance on the power system. We can also uh, look into flexible demand. Um, and, and there are many ways that this could be implemented, um, and, and different countries are going to find different potential and different ways of, of going about this. But uh, this could be uh, direct uh, load control or real-time pricing. Um, we have an example in, in Texas here in the United States where uh, a number of industrial units are, are paid to pro provide contingency reserve. And so if, if a unit generating unit trips offline or a large transmission line uh, trips open, um, these industrial processes can quickly reduce their demand, which uh, from, from the point of view of the power system, that's kind of like increasing uh, output from a generator. So we, we think that from the policy point of view, it's important to make sure that the rules for uh, either participating in market or for uh, otherwise being able to provide a demand response, the rules have to be set up in such a way that they're, they're really aimed at capability. So as a system operator, to some extent, I don't really care if I'm deploying a demand response, a, a, an industrial user, user, by pushing the button to say I'm going to reduce its load and, and pay them the price, or if I'm going to push a button to increase generation from a unit. If, if the capabilities are the same, I give them both five minutes notice. They can ramp it at 100 megawatts in, in 20 minutes, uh, you know, and, and those kinds of capabilities, I really should be indifferent between the two, and I, I could push the button for the one that delivers what I need at minimum cost. So we think the rules are really important to get right with demand response. Uh, moving on to some uh, myths and, and frequently asked questions. Um, People ask, well, you know, can my grid support a high level of variable renewable? And, and I, I won't go through this whole graph, but you can see Denmark hit 39% penetration from wind in 2014. Uh, Denmark is a small country. They have a lot of wind relative to demand. They have large interconnections with, with the, the Nordic power pool and, and much of Europe, which really helps them out a lot. Uh, down at the bottom of this graph, you see Ireland which is uh, literally an island. It's an island geographically and electrically. And in 2013, the interconnection with Great Britain was not working. The pump storage was not working. And so this 18% annual penetration in Ireland uh, was, was achieved with no interconnection market, external market, or anything. Uh, now, having said that, the Irish generation fleet has been designed to be fairly flexible because they know they cannot depend on on other units. But, but this gives you sort of a range. Uh, Denmark, on the one hand, small, large interconnections. Um, Ireland, 18 uh, percent. Ireland has some pretty uh, high renewable energy objectives. Uh, they're not stopping at 18 percent, and they're actually going through a, a, a market redesign right now to try to uh, make sure that their market allows them full access to uh, physical uh, capabilities. Uh, people often uh, ask, you know, gee, I, I have a, 
a 100 megawatt wind plant, don't I need to have a backup for that wind plant? And the answer is you could, but it would be needlessly expensive because we don't back up individual units in the power system. Reserve policies and methods that we have for calculating reserves take into account the entire system. And we never back up individual plants unless there's some sort of a market imperfection that, that uh, might otherwise require me to do that. But, but in every case, if you're building an individual backup, you're needlessly increasing cost. Um, we, we do know that wind and solar can increase the need for operating reserve, uh, but there, there are a couple of interesting things. If I, if I have an increase in wind generation over a couple of hours, I'm going to be needing to turn down some other generation. Uh, maybe it's a gas unit, maybe it's a coal unit. So if that, uh, if that unit that I've turned down was generating at 300 megawatts and now it's at 200 megawatts, that unit now has the capability of providing 100 megawatts of up reserve. And so I don't need to have another backup, per se, of wind. And the other thing to note is that, let's, let's take two extreme examples. I have a, a wind plant and it's generating zero right now because it, there's no wind. Well, I don't need any reserve to guard against wind dropping off because it's already zero. It can't go below zero. And the other extreme, suppose that my wind is generating at 100%. Well, if it's at 100%, it might drop off. And so I might want to have some sort of reserve, not necessarily one-to-one -one reserve, but a reserve to help me uh, in case the wind does drop off. But I know that if the wind is at maximum output, it can't increase. And so I don't need to worry about um, down reserves from other units. So uh, there are a number of methods for calculating this, but, but essentially this is a dynamic reserve that depends on what the wind and solar um, is, is doing. Uh, do we need storage? Well, uh, I don't know. We love storage. Um, but you do not need storage to integrate large amounts of renewable energy. Uh, as I pointed out, Ireland uh, successfully managed 18 percent over the year. Uh, with no storage whatsoever. Uh, we've done a, a, a number of integration studies, the Western Wind and Solar Studies, uh, the California PJM, uh, that, that have looked at up, up to 30 percent annual penetration without needing storage. Now, if you have storage already, the storage will be used in a way that will, will be beneficial. Uh, storage is almost always helpful, but it isn't necessary. Uh, we recently completed a study um, in Minnesota looking at up to 50 percent annual penetration from wind and solar and, and there was no need for storage that was that was found in that either. Uh, moving on, um, historically people have, have been uh, have asked questions about integration costs of wind or of solar and over the last several years I think that conversation has changed because uh, every type of generation imposes some sort of a cost on the system. Uh, this, the three graphs that you see here have um, several days, maybe a week and a half, two, two weeks worth of, of uh, data. Um, this is a simplified system to illustrate a, a couple of things. So if you look at the upper right-hand panel, this is a, a simple system that has one cold generator in, that's shown in black, constant output. The dark blue shows natural gas combined cycle. Uh, and they move around, they, they go up and down every day. And then the, uh, the light, uh, light blue or turquoise shows combustion turbines. And that's all very nice. It shows that the three plants can meet demand for the, for the time period. Um, then we add wind in the middle panel. And the wind is shown in green. And uh, let me draw your attention, as, as I seem to do a lot, to the coal plant, the black. Now the coal is cycling. And you say, well, OK, the integrating all that wind has caused the coal plant to cycle. The coal plant's going to be operating a little bit less efficiently, and so shouldn't that be an integration cost of wind? Well, let's, let's take yet a third example. So if you jump down to the very bottom, we don't have any wind, but now we have nuclear, which uh, almost always in the U.S. at least runs at, at constant baseload output. And now take a look at what happens to the coal plants. The coal plants are cycling. And so this is just a, a simple example that shows that many different types of generators 
might have some sort of integration cost. But what's really important is the total cost of the system. How much does it cost to operate the system? How much does it cost to build uh, the, the pieces that we need, uh, you know, buy flexible generation, build transmission, and so forth. So uh, we, we think the conversation has changed a lot to look at total cost. Uh, so let, let me wrap up here. I, I know I've covered a lot of material here, but uh, wind and solar certainly do increase variabil variability and uncertainty. Uh, we know that there are a lot of ways that we can manage that, both through physical assets as well as institutional operating practice. Uh, we have experience now around the world that shows that at least 39% can be achieved. Uh, Denmark, Ireland, many other countries are aiming for much more renewable energy than what they have today, and I think they'll get there. Um, a lot of the things that we can do to help with uh, operational changes, make improvements to efficiency, are, are, are institutional kinds of things. Um, and, and they deliver a lot of benefit for um, a relatively low cost in, in many cases. And uh, we don't need specific backup, nor do we need specific storage for variable renewables. Storage is always good. We do need to think about how we're going to operate the system with flexibility reserves. Um, and specific questions can be answered with uh, detailed analysis and modeling uh, so that we, we can uh, better get, a, uh, get a better grasp of how to integrate a lot of wind and solar. So at this point, let me turn this over to uh, Jessica, who's going to talk a little bit about the Greening the Grid Toolkit. So Jessica? Thanks so much, Michael. And hello to everyone on the line. Um, I have the privilege today of introducing you to a new initiative called Greening the Grid, which is an initiative sponsored by the US Agency for International Development. Um, as Michael's excellent presentation has showed us, grid integration is a really rich area of study. Um, and there's constantly new research and case studies that are emerging as more and more power systems gain experience in integrating variable wind and solar to the grid. Greening the Grid aims to put the latest and greatest information about grid integration into the hands of power system decision makers and their support organizations. Um, Greening the Grid is a technical assistance project. Its, its objective is to inform energy system planners, regulators, and grid operators in overcoming the challenges associated with integrating variable renewable energy to the grid. Greening the Grid offers two types of support. The first is a toolkit of information and guidance materials that are intended to inform power systems in developing and implementing grid integration roadmaps. And the second is direct technical assistance to uh, power system operators and planners in developing countries. And that technical assistance is tailored to the unique needs of each partner. USAID is partnering with INREL to deliver assistance through Greening the Grid under a program called Enhancing Capacity for Low Emission Development Strategies, um, which supports countries around the world in meeting their economic growth and development goals while minimizing greenhouse gas emissions. Grid integration is emerging as a critical issue for many countries that are working toward low emission development. So our program is intended to provide support specifically on this topic with the ultimate goal of helping countries meet their clean energy and climate change goals. This summer we launched the Greening the Grid Toolkit. It comes in the form of a website and it is live. You can access it at greeningthegrid.org. Our vision is to establish this website as a platform for the best available information, guidance, and case studies on grid integration. The website also serves as a gateway to access training materials like this webinar and also technical assistance. And it serves as a repository for several different types of resources. And all of the resources and materials on this site are in the public domain, so there's no cost of anything on here. One example of a resource that you'll find on the Greening the Grid website are short fact sheets on grid integration topics. INREL develops these fact sheets with a developing country audience in mind. Most are only two pages, so they're really intended to, find, to, to provide a high-level introduction to key grid, grid, grid integration issues, and those range from everything from target setting to balancing area coordination to data requirements for grid integration studies and many of the other topics that Michael covered in his presentation. Several of these fact sheets are now available on the website, and more are coming in the coming months. Um, the titles are all listed on this slide. And once complete, this 
collection will consist of about a dozen of these documents. Beyond the fact sheets, which provides sort of a concise overview of grid integration issues, the Greening the Grid Toolkit also provides a set of in-depth resource pages organized by topic, um, ranging from ancillary services to balancing area coordination and the others that you see here. These in-depth resource pages are really the heart of the toolkit, and we developed these with the philosophy that there is already a significant body of knowledge about grid integration. So the intent here is really to collect and contextualize the best of what is out there, again with systems in developing countries in mind. Each topic page includes an introduction to that topic, um, a list of examples of actions that a power system can take, and a curated and annotated list of resources. And those resources include tools, reports, case studies, and I think maybe one of the most valuable pieces are example policies and regulations from other systems related to that topic. As I mentioned, greeningthegrid.org also provides a gateway to targeted technical assistance. That assistance comes in two different formats. Um, the first and the one we suggest that most users access initially is the Ask an Expert service. This is something that we've partnered with the Clean Energy Solutions Center and the Clean Energy Grid Integration Network to provide. To use this service, we make a form available on the website and anyone can submit a, a question or a request about grid integration. We then review that request and partner the requester with an expert from NREL or the Solutions Center Network. And that expert provides no cost technical assistance to the requester. This service is intended to provide higher level guidance and it can be used, uh, for example, to request technical review of documents like grid codes or policies or strategies um, to ask specific questions about your power system and grid integration in that context or to request examples from other systems. We really welcome requests through this platform and we'd also love to get the word out about it. Um, so we encourage you to let your organizations and partners know about this service. Along with the Ask an Expert service, we're also working with a select number of our EC-led partner countries to conduct more in-depth demonstration projects. And these are ongoing projects that are centered on activities like developing grid integration studies, integrating forecasting into system operations, and addressing the challenges related to integrating distributed solar to the grid. The rollout of the greeningthegrid.org website represents the first phase of this effort, and in the next few months we're going to be continuing to build it out and add more content, um, such as additional fact sheets and integration topics, as I mentioned. Today also marks the kickoff of the Greening the Grid webinar series, which we're, operating, which we're offering in coordination with the Solutions Center. Um, the next webinar will be on best practice, practices in grid integration studies. It'll be in the September timeframe, so please stay tuned for the exact date on that. And we plan to offer these webinars about once every six weeks on different topics. Uh, we will also be posting the webinars as web-based trainings on the website. Again, we'll be rolling out the demonstration projects with our partner countries, and we plan to post the outputs of those projects, um, be they templates or reports or other project products, to the website so that um, they could be useful to other systems. And finally, we're hoping to incorporate more case studies and examples from developing countries into our resources, since many of what's available in the public domain are, are from the US and, and Europe. So we really welcome any feedback on resources that you know of that you'd like to see highlighted. And we also invite you to submit um, ideas for fact sheets or integration topics or issues that aren't already covered in our materials. And of course, um, we'd love to get your feedback on the toolkit in general. Our contact information is at the end of this presentation. And of course, you can always reach us through greeningthegrid.org. So with that, I think we're going to move to questions and panel, and I'll turn it back over to Tim and Jim. Tim and Jim, I don't think we can hear you yet. Can't hear it, 
some of your questions um, on the screen here. So um, maybe we'll 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 moderate and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll moderate and. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll Oh, sure. Um, so the reason that you don't need storage is that we... In the U.S., we have a lot of natural gas uh, generation, which can usually be dispatched down. So if I, if I have a period where there's a lot of wind, I can turn down or turn off the gas plant. And in a sense, I'm storing the natural gas. I, I'm not burning it. So it's, it's not exactly the same kind of story. Hi, Jessica, are you able to hear us? Hi, Jessica, are you able Hi, to hear us? Are you able to hear us? Hi, everybody. Sorry, just having a couple of technical issues. We'll resolve these in a second. And uh, just give us one moment while we work this out. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, we're just resolving an uh, audio okay, issue they're, really quick, they're and we'll get back to you in a second. Hi everybody, sorry for the technical issues. Uh, we're back now and so uh, we'll continue with the question and answer session. Okay, I, I'll, I'll repeat the uh, question because I'm not sure if anybody heard me. Um, the, the question was uh, explain more about why we do not need any storage when we have 30% uh, uh, energy from wind and solar. Uh, the, the answer to that question is, is because we we typically have generation on the system that can be controlled or even turned off. And so during periods of high wind or high solar, we, we can turn down a, a, a gas unit or we can turn down a coal unit, as you saw in some of the graphs. And, and that, that sort of makes room, if you will, for the wind or the solar energy. When the wind and solar energy uh, dies off uh, because the sun goes down or because the wind stops blowing, we then have these generators that we've turned down or turned off that we can then uh, increase the output. Um, so in, in a sense, during periods of time when it is windy or, or sunny and we're getting wind or solar energy, in a sense what we are doing is, is storing the fuel that otherwise would have been burned in a gas plant or a coal plant, or we might be saving the hydro, the, saving the water behind the dam, 
which is a form of storage. But we use essentially fuel storage already, and, and that's why we don't need uh, separate storage like batteries or pump storage necessarily to help integrate large amounts of wind or solar. Great, thank you, Michael. So we've been getting a lot of questions coming in, so please continue to submit those. And while you do that, we just had a great question come in about forecasting. So we have a lot of folks interested in understanding a little bit more about how forecasting or the role of wind and solar forecasting can enable the integration of variable renewable energy into the grid. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, because many power plants need some notice before they're available to be used for energy, uh, a forecast is helpful. And the forecast, the, the, the way that you do the forecast will depend to some extent on how the system is operated. But a fairly typical case would be uh, day ahead, the day ahead before uh, you know, the, the time in question, uh, the system operator uh, has a, a demand forecast and, and then gets all the generators ready to go, turn them on and, and make sure that there's fuel and all of that uh, so that they can be operated the next day. And part of that process, what, when you have wind and solar, is to develop a day ahead forecast. Now the day ahead forecast by its nature is, is not going to be as accurate as a forecast would be, let's say one hour in advance, but the day ahead forecast uh, can typically provide enough information so that I can decide whether or not I want to start a particular thermal plant or not start it. Um, if I start a plant today that I don't need tomorrow, that's a needless cost that I've, I've uh, incurred and I, I'd like to avoid that. And conversely, if I don't start a plant today that it turns out I do need tomorrow, then I might have a reliability issue. I may not have enough generation on the system to meet demand. So the day ahead forecast plays a really important role in, in deciding which units, which generating units to start up and have available. And once I get within the day, uh, the forecast can help me decide how to do the economic dispatch. If, if for example, I expect a big windstorm to be coming through in the next hour, I, I then uh, can prepare by uh, turning down or getting units ready to turn down in advance of that windstorm. And if it's a really severe windstorm, it may be that the wind, it's so windy that some of the turbines turn off. If I have a forecast that tells me that that type of thing is, is possible or likely, that can help me in, in get my system uh, ready to go so that I, I'm not caught unprepared. So generally forecasts are, are always helpful. The, uh, the, the, the last comment I'd like to make about forecasts is that um, you know, frequently updating the forecast can be a, a valuable thing because as you get closer to real time, the forecast accuracy can improve. But at the same time, there needs to be some sort of an operator action associated with a, a new forecast. So for example, if somebody says, uh, you know, I can give you a, a pretty accurate two hour ahead forecast, uh, the, the question becomes, what is the system operator going to be doing two hours ahead of real time? And if there's no system operator action that happens two hours before real time, that forecast may not be terribly useful. Great. Thank you, Michael. So we've had a lot of questions coming in with regard to developing country context. So many times developing countries uh, have very different situations. For example, they have capacity challenges or they have a lack of markets. So what do you think some of the ways uh, that flexibility can be improved in these systems. So these non-market contexts or systems where there are capacity challenges, how much renewable energy can they handle and what are some ways to improve that flexibility? Well, that, that's a good question. I, I suspect that th there's not a one size fits all answer, but I think markets themselves aren't necessary to achieve the things that, that we know will help with renewable integration. There, there are two factors that, that I talked about in the presentation. That, that help a lot. And, and one of those, if you recall, is enlarging the size of the balancing area. And, and the second one is to uh, go to a faster economic dispatch, going to you know five minute or sub hourly dispatch. Both of those can, uh, can be done with a market, but it's not necessary that you have a market. It, it could be that you have a, a utility, it, it may or may not be state owned, it, it's a a more or less a monopoly uh, type of system. And, and what can happen is that the, the system operator, whether you're in a market or not, 
uh, can talk to neighboring systems about various uh, levels of coordination, um, can also uh, in, in incorporate a faster time step for economic dispatch. Now, uh, those don't come for free. Um, so if you're moving from a, a, a slower dispatch, maybe hourly, maybe even a couple of hours, to a sub-hourly dispatch, there, there will be a need for um, increased tools to enhance system visibility so that you, you can see what's happening on the system. Uh, there may be a need for uh, new computer hardware and software uh, that can help do, uh, do the faster economic dispatch. Uh, but but those, those things are achievable. They may not always be easy, but I don't think you, you necessarily have to have a market structure in order to have a large balancing region and in order to do a fast economic dispatch. And Michael, what about the case of capacity limited countries? Capacity limitations, uh, those can pose a challenge. And I, I think that um, you know, renewable energy can help with that challenge to some degree. Uh, it may not be able to solve all the problems, but uh, in cases where there is a, a capacity limit, I, I assume that the question is referring to limited uh, generating capacity. So I, I may not have the ability of supplying demand at all times. I, I, I think that that might present a, an interesting, possibly challenging opportunity uh, to maybe develop some some more um, I would say operating rules or, or a framework around moving from uh, curtailment that that may be undertaken by the system operator based on, on sort of last minute judgment as opposed to a demand response type of program where instead of uh, curtailing demand that uh, may not be economic to curtail in other ways. I, I could maybe put together demand response program somewhat more easily because if if some consumers are used to being curtailed already, then I think it might make sense to sort of explore that as an option to say well, how can we we make that curtailment more economic and bringing it into a demand response framework of some type uh, that that could actually help with uh, with integrating uh, variable renewables on the system. Great. We are getting a lot of questions about islands and how islands can be very unique systems. So what is the, the difference or what is the cutoff for maybe a small versus a larger island system? And in the island case, what are some of the, the options that really need to be considered? Is storage more important in that situation? What are some of the things that can be done on these smaller situations? That, that's a good question. It's, it's kind of a hard question because uh, a lot of the benefits that, that we look at in power systems to integrate renewables comes from large size, and, and that, that may not be possible in many cases. So in the, uh, with an island system, I think the, the issues are a bit more acute uh, because you, you can't depend on neighboring systems. Uh, do you need storage? I, I, I won't say that you do, but storage may become a more attractive option. When you take a look at, at the types of flexibility that may be available, it, it ranges. There, there are many technologies, for example, reciprocating engines, uh, which, which are relatively small generators that can be, you, you, you know, if you get a, a 10 megawatt engine um, that, that ramps from zero to full output in, in a matter of five or maybe 10 minutes, uh, you, you could also buy a whole series of these engines uh, and, and the ramping capability would scale linearly. Um, and those, those types of units or, or aeroderivative uh, turbines can be turned up and turned down fairly, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so those, those may be options. Um, other more controllable generation, whether it's from hydro, if there's some controllable hydro on the island would be, would be useful. Um, but it, it may come down to a, a requirement for some sort of storage if other options are not available. And if that, if that does happen, it, it will likely increase the, the cost compared to what you might be able to do in a larger system. Um, I know that I'm not real close to this work, but I know there's a lot of uh, work going on in Hawaii uh, really pushing the envelope um, on, on what you have to do for the system. And they, I know they have a, a bunch of old uh, oil burners for, for generators that uh, historically they have not operated in a very flexible manner. And, and so the question is, uh, technically, can I can I change the way I operate those units? So I, I cycle them more often, turning them up and down. I turn them off more often, or is there an inherent limitation to the device? 
Uh, if there is an inherent limitation, uh, sometimes that can be solved by retrofitting it with either enhanced controls or, or uh, other features that can help make existing generators uh, more flexible. So there, it, it's a hard question because there's no one-size-fits-all, but I think that there are a number of flexibility options that, that you'd want to look at if you're an island system. And I, I do think that the challenges are going to be uh, maybe a little bit higher uh, on an island system. And something to point out is that we do have a lot of resources for islands and to answer some of these questions on greeningthegrid.org. So we're excited to keep hearing from you on that, that forum. Uh, in the meantime, we've had a lot of questions coming in about distributed generation, specifically distributed PV. Michael, do you think you can speak to some of the challenges that are particular to integrated distributed PV versus utility scale or large scale PV? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I know here in the U.S. there's a lot of attention that's being focused on that issue. Um, primarily, and, and I don't know if this is true in, in, all, uh, in all parts of the world, but I know it's true here and in, in, in many parts of the world, the distributed PV is not visible to the power system operator. So I'm running the transmission system. I know where, where all the, the, the large generators are. I know what the transmission line loading is. I know what demand is. Um, actually, I may not even know what demand is because now if I have a lot of uh, solar PV on the distribution network, I can't really tell if, if a cloud has come by and, and uh, reduced solar output or if somebody just turned on a, a big massive load of some kind. And so I think uh, one of the biggest challenges is to figure out a way for the, the distributed solar to be visible to the power system operator uh, so that decisions on how to best operate the rest of the system can be made uh, efficiently. Um, the, the, issue, the other issue can be, um, you know, the, sort of the, the you, you may be getting some backflow from the distribution system to the transmission system, which isn't necessarily a problem, uh, but, but again, you, you need the ability of, of being able to see what's happening and, and probably some means of of controlling uh, the, the PV. As I mentioned earlier, wind turbines can provide, uh, can respond to all kinds of signals. PV panels can also, uh, but, but the question is if I have a thousand rooftop panels and I need, as a system operator, need to reduce their output, what sort of equipment do I need to do that? Uh, there's got to be communication, there's got to be control, um, and, and how do I best do that as a system operator? So I, I think that's a it's a great question. I don't I don't have an answer much better than this, but I, I do think that the challenges really come down to visibility and, and potentially control, um, so that I, I understand from the operational point of view exactly what's going on. So we have been getting a lot of questions about flexibility in thermal systems, and so someone someone was curious about really what does turning up or cycling turning up and down or cycling thermal plants really mean? And how do you actually increase the technical limits of those coal plants? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And I, I'm not an expert on, on uh, coal plant design, but I, uh, I know that not all coal plants are created equal. Uh, some plants are designed to be flexible. Other plants are designed to be run at, at base load. Uh, so if the plant is designed to be run at base load, there may be some things that you can do to it. I, I know that... Um, the, the, the boiler tubes, for example, are, are several, well, basically everything, but the boiler tubes in particular are sensitive to uh, thermal gradients, you know, extreme changes in temperature over short amounts of time. And, and so those, those uh, tubes can kind of basically break. Um, but in, in a case where a, a coal plant is designed to be run at base load, uh, nobody probably cared that much about designing uh, tubes that are strong enough to withstand the thermal stresses of, of a, a lot of these uh, thermal changes. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, every coal plant's different. There, there are, um, you know, companies that can come in and assess a plant and say, you know, here, here's, uh, here's what you can do uh, to increase the efficient, or sorry, to increase the flexibility out of that unit. Um, and I don't know that you could necessarily get the same level of flexibility if you if you retrofit to two different units, uh, but, but I think that's something that, that's worth looking at. We, we tend to think of flexibility options as a, as a whole suite of things, and, and so 
for any given particular system, uh, I would want to take a look at, you know, what are the, the five or ten or however many options are there uh, for increasing flexibility. And I'd, I'd want to go after the ones that are cheapest first. Um, and if that gives me enough flexibility, that's great. I'm done. I haven't spent that much money. Uh, if that doesn't give me enough flexibility, then I need to go to the more expensive one. But I think that there's there's a lot of potential for, for many plans to be retrofit so that they can become uh, more flexible. But that, that's sort of up to the individual uh, owner and, and uh, the engineering firm to come in and, and assess the plan. And Michael, is there an impact of that cycling of those thermal plants on the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the system? That's a great question. Um, Yes, but it's a very minimal impact. We, we did a, a really large study here at NREL uh, that we published a year and a half or so ago. It's called the Western Wind and Solar Integration Study, Phase 2. And we, we actually did a couple of things in that study that were, uh, I think, one of a kind and, and very, very detailed. One of them was that we, we got pretty detailed information about the impact of, of cycling on thermal plants, uh, both coal and gas plants. And we built those costs into the economic dispatch. And we did find the dispatch changed a little bit. The cost changed a little bit. Uh, but the other thing we did was we, we got actual emission curves from every generating unit in the Western interconnection for every thermal generator. Uh, we got that based on empirical data. And that empirical data shows what happens when the plant is started, when the plant stopped, when it's turned down to a less efficient point when it ramps up, when it ramps down, all of those things were captured in our modeling. And what we found was that there was a small penalty, if you will, on, on the emissions when the, the plants were cycled. But, and I, I don't recall the exact numbers, but it, it, if we reduced emissions by somewhere, somewhere around 30% uh, overall, and when you take the cycling into account, instead of 30%, we found the benefit was maybe around 29%. So yes, there is an impact, uh, but, but not much of one. And if you think about what's really happening, when I've got that, uh, that amount of wind and solar on the system, I, I may have a couple of thermal plants that are going to be operating at a less efficient point. They may be burning more fuel per megawatt hour. But on the other hand, I've turned off a whole bunch of plants. And, and that impact of turning off many plants is going to really drive the emission reduction and, and will by far overwhelm any small penalty I might have by taking a small number of plants down to an inefficient loading point. I think we have time for just one last question. And this question has to do with really the, the state of the art right now. And so I'm going to try to, to merge several different incoming requests in this. So from your perspective, what are really the most relevant and state of the art things right now in terms of planning and the type of tools that you need for planning for capacity additions, et cetera? What's the state of the art that we should be watching in terms of technologies? And what's the state of the art in more the soft side of the system? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let, let me see if I can, I can uh, address at least parts of that. So from, from the planning point of view, I, I think one of the things that we've we've been able to see over the last several years is that the development of, of high quality renewable energy data sets is really critical not only to doing integration studies but but to do an assessment of flexibility and, and for example um, if I'll take India as, as one example so in, in India you've got some pretty aggressive renewable energy targets and so then the, the logical question would be well okay if, if we if we aim for you know 50 megawatts of, of uh, sorry 50,000 megawatts of wind and, and, and 30,000 megawatts of, of solar whatever the numbers are what sort of flexibility do we need in the rest of the power system we can actually help we, we can look at that by by taking uh, the annual hourly demand and and then say let's let's imagine that uh, wind and solar is built in these capacities at these locations and and we can look at the same kind of curve that I showed you early on in the presentation that shows the demand by itself and then we subtract off the the wind and solar and we can see what sort of flexibility is needed 
in the remaining part of the fleet. So from that, you can calculate what sort of minimum run level might I need, uh, what sort of ramp rates might I be needing. And of course, um, you know, you, you want to do maybe a couple of scenarios to try to get an idea of what sort of flexibility do I need. I think the transmission planning tools, I don't think there's a, a need to fundamentally change what we do there. But um, of course, when we're building out renewable energy, we're somewhat constrained with respect to where we put the wind and solar. But I think there are a lot of interesting questions, maybe in particular with wind. Uh, suppose I have two locations in which I'm considering putting a, a large wind plant. One location is closer to demand, which wouldn't require very much transmission, but the wind is not as energetic. Uh, the other location is further away, which requires more transmission, but the wind, you know, for a given level of, of capacity, I would get a lot more energy out of it. So I, I think that's an interesting trade-off that, that, that can be looked at. And I think the existing tools allow us to do that with, with planning models um, and transmission models and so forth. Moving to operations, um, the, the things that help us integrate wind and solar also help us more efficiently operate the power system without wind and solar. And those are the, some of the things I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, large balancing regions, the fast economic dispatch. Uh, what, what you need for that is, is visibility. You need to be able to see what's happening on your system. And, and we see in the U.S. There's, there's a need for more visibility. We have uh, every so often we've got reliability issues that you know somebody couldn't see what was happening and so uh, a part of the grid goes dark. Um, so you need that for efficient integration. Uh, with respect to you know technical sources of flexibility, you know storage is always great. I, I think the the only downside to storage is uh, particularly batteries is the cost is high, but there's also some complications with respect to how do I know when I should charge my storage and how do I know when I should discharge my storage. So you need good forecast to use it. Forecasting technology is getting better. And I, I think the other uh, interesting source of flexibility is coming out of uh, well, two different sources. Um, aeroderivative turbines, which are basically jet engines which are turned into generators. Uh, they can ramp very quickly. They can start very quickly. They have uh, minimal heat rate degradation at, at startup and, and over the ramping cycle. Um, they're, they're pretty efficient. Um, and, and so that's one source of, of flexibility. Another one, uh, as I mentioned earlier, reciprocating engines. Uh, it's a little bit different technology. Both of these can cycle very, very quickly from start to full load at uh, maybe five to ten minutes. Uh, the recips can be scaled linearly by getting a whole bunch of small units. We're starting to see a few of those uh, in place. We have one here in Colorado, um, not too far away, and it's, it's being used in the public service system that I showed you earlier. Um, and, and then I think the, the last operational thing is, is take advantage of the fact that you can squeeze a lot of flexibility out of, out of wind plants and, and solar, particularly central solar. Um, and I mentioned some of the possible difficulties with distributed solar. We, we don't want to do a lot of curtailing of wind and solar, obviously, because that's going to limit the, the objective, which is to reduce emissions. But on the other hand, um, there's a lot of flexibility that can be obtained from, these, uh, from the renewable sources themselves. And I think that's a fairly new and, and pretty innovative thing. The slide I showed you earlier from Public Service of Colorado is, I don't know that it's one of a kind, but uh, Public Service of Colorado is a real leader in terms of coming up with interesting and creative solutions for how to integrate a lot, a lot of wind. I, I don't remember. They have 2,800 megawatts of wind on about a 6,000 megawatt system. So, and it's, it's not very well connected to the rest of the world. So uh, I think there are a lot of innovative things that are, that are emerging. Um, hopefully that gives you an idea of at least some of them. Great, Michael. Thank you, Michael and Jessica. This has been really informative. And I'd like to encourage everyone, if you have further questions, uh, you can contact everyone on the panel on the email addresses that you see there. And I'd, I'd like everyone to try and head over to www.greeningthegrid.org, where we will have other training materials and these slides available, and of course, lots more information for you. I'd like to turn it back over to our colleagues from the Clean Energy Solutions Center.
All right, thank you uh, all three of you, Jessica, Jennifer, and Michael, um, for that uh, great webinar. Uh, before we wrap up here, uh, we just have a quick survey for uh, those in attendance, three questions that will uh, appear on your screen shortly. And uh, we ask that you just go ahead and uh, answer those. Your feedback's important to us as we uh, strive to always uh, ensure that we provide quality webinars. Um, so with that, if you will please answer those questions. And the next question coming up. And finally, the third question. All right, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to extend one last thank you to all of our expert panelists, as well as to all of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we will uh, invite you to check the Solutions Center website where you can see the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentation, which should be uh, posted within the week. Uh, you'll also find previously held webinars on the Solutions Center website as well. Uh, the recording will also be posted to the Clean Energy Solutions YouTube channel, uh, and we invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solution Center resources and services, including our no-cost policy support, uh, Ask an Expert, which now includes support through Green and the Grid as well. Uh, we ask that you all enjoy the rest of your, your days or your evenings, as the case may be, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. Thank you again, and this concludes the webinar.